This is 43 year old Christopher Kilpatrick. This is the man that Lauderdale authorities are looking for the 22 push up challenge. And what you'll notice first is a lot of this dirt. I am literally stepping off the road right now, taking one step. Look at that. There's no guarantee we'll see it. The order guarantees Brown's defense will get evidence. Still a packed room of happy people. Congressman Mo Brooks just elected to his fifth term. Look at this. You can rent these little scooters. Our taking action investigation reveals it doesn't appear anyone from the state noticed until he became a murder suspect. And it's not like anything you've ever thrown before. These right here closer to the building just suffered some damage. But then to my left, you can see all of those golf carts just totally destroyed by this fire. Oh, there we go, you guys. Good morning. This man burglarized both Huntsville Utilities and Apon Pawn Shop on Blue Spring Road on May 1st, 2016. This is a picture of the man Huntsville Police arrested, Stephen McDowell, and this is the perpetrator. The district attorney's office says both pictures show McDowell, but Stephen and his family point out the differences they think are obvious. I looked at the picture, I handed it right back to him because it's like, how do you not know your own kid? Like, why do you need to study a photograph to see is this really my kid, you know? <laughs> no, it's not him. For example, they say Stephen's skin is lighter, his eyes closer together, his lips lighter colored and different sizes. They also point out this chicken pox scar on the left side of his face and his nose. Stephen's mother, Tam Jackson, says the noses aren't the same sizes nor structure. I just want people to see that this isn't my baby. Stephen's former landlord, with whom he has a rough relationship, pointed him out after the surveillance picture aired on the news. The police reports show there were fingerprints found, but analysis of them was not concluded in the evidence against Stephen. The video shows the subject, but they never checked his height. Investigators went to Stephen's mother, who said it wasn't her son. Then the police caught up with Stephen outside of Huntsville Hospital. His two-year-old nephew was inside, on life support, dying. Police told him to show up for questioning. A lawyer told him not to. Officers issued a warrant for his arrest. Now his mother is talking to WHNT News 19 to get her son's story out and argue his innocence. There is really no evidence linking Stephen to anything. There's no, there's no evidence. Like there's no fingerprints. There's no motive. The surveillance video is the only significant piece of evidence the prosecutor's office turned over to the defense in discovery. Jackson says the crime doesn't match his character. I couldn't put the two together like my son doing a burglary. I couldn't because that's not in his nature. He's not like that. McDowell says he has no criminal history. A check of Alabama court records shows that as well. He serves in the U.S. Army Reserves, did a tour in Afghanistan, has a wife and a job. McDowell and his family haven't pinpointed where Stephen was during the time of the crimes, but they argue innocent people don't track their every move. We're not criminals. We don't live our lives trying to figure out, hey, can you make sure you tell so and so I was over here at so and so a time? We don't we just we just live. When word of our story started getting around, things started changing for McDowell. Two days ago, the district attorney's office decided not to prosecute, but Stephen would still have to wait five years for the charges on his record to go away. Less than 12 hours ago, the state signed off on a court order to dismiss the case with prejudice, meaning McDowell will never face charges for these crimes again. For him and his family, today is the day they've dreamed of for months. A triple murder in Gunnersville shocked this quaint town, the first killings in nearly a decade. The victims include a seven-year-old boy spending time with his great-grandmother. Brutally murdered. He's leaving anybody down here. That's pretty tough. Jimmy O'Neill Spencer is the man police hold responsible for the July 13th triple murder. The state's Board of Pardons and Paroles didn't think he needed to spend more time in prison, so they let him out early. Then Spencer didn't think he needed to stay at his court mandated halfway house. We came to Montgomery to the Alabama Board of Pardons and Paroles and spoke to the board spokesperson who says that Spencer's supervising officer had no idea Spencer left his court mandated halfway house early. Whenever he got arrested in Gunnersville, that's when it came to the realization 
that he was not living at the halfway house. That is when it came to our attention. Spencer's case file included multiple prison escapes, a prison assault, and a burglary attempt that resulted in him getting shot. That information is available to the board. Why was he able to be paroled, though? I can't tell you what goes on in the board member's mind. I mean, they, they're given the information, uh, they're presented the information. If they didn't have a lot of uh, any issues over the past, dozen or so years or however long, a lot of times they will give a person the benefit of the doubt. The board sent him to a halfway house in Birmingham, then he left. Again, how could this have happened? Anybody that we supervise, they're mandated contacts that they're supposed to make, and in those contacts are home visits, per, you know, employment checks, things along those lines. The board says Spencer was checking in, he just wasn't telling the truth. He was still reporting, he was still listing the address, so we thought he was still where he was. Doesn't raise any flags at the time. Spencer came out of prison with multiple burglary and escape convictions. Authorities say he used his freedom to get into more trouble. A drug-related arrest in Etowah County, a run-in with police at Gunnersville State Park. Still, the board didn't realize he wasn't at a halfway house in Birmingham until... Cases do go wrong. People do get hurt. For the people of Alabama, that's just not good enough. Taking action, Courtney Crown, WHNT News 19. 25 year old Abigail Stafford and her husband are a young family with a new baby and new priorities. All of our money is put where it needs to be. The couple purchased this house on Kaufman Drive in Athens last May. Abigail thought it was the perfect place to raise their family. We found something that was affordable for right then, well within our means. That was then. And now it's well without. The mortgage fit within their budget and even left a little extra in their bank account. I didn't want to get too high to where we could be comfortable. But they didn't realize the federal government would be so involved. It caught me off guard. The Staffords were delighted to find their dream home and thrilled when their offer got accepted. But then they went to see their mortgage company. That's when they learned the federal government would require them to have flood insurance, even though the sellers told them the house had never flooded over the previous 30 years. An extra $250 a month is crazy. It's like, where are we going to find this? The news shocked the Staffords and the previous owners, who agreed to pay for the first year of coverage. But now it's time to renew. And that's what caused our mortgage payment to go up almost $200, $250. So we were going to end up paying almost $1,000 a month for the house. and. There's just no way because our minimum budget was, our max budget was 750. Abigail and her husband tried to challenge the flood zone three times. They said that I'm still required. WHNT News 19 is taking action to investigate if there's any solution for her family. We shared her story with Micah Cochran. He's the city of Athens geographic information systems coordinator. Usually we get the, the calls like the couple that you uh, interviewed of Oh, we're in a flood zone. Cochran showed me FEMA's map of the city of Athens, separated by the three flood districts, flood zones X, A, E, and A. X is outside the flood zone. Zone A, E has a designated area for flooding. Zone A is an area with nearly a 1% chance of flooding per year. The Stafford's home is in zone A. There's not much you can do with the zone A. We don't know. We don't know what the risk is, so they're going to have to carry flood insurance. No matter where you're purchasing a home, check whether you need to carry flood insurance. Every community has a floodplain administrator and a call to them could save you lots of money. It's hundreds, perhaps thousands of extra dollars more per year. This flood map dates back to 2009. FEMA is releasing a new map in August. Unfortunately, the Staffords shouldn't bank on any changes. No, they're still in the flood zone. It's complicated, but we're going to make it work because we have to. Abigail doesn't want unexpected insurance costs to sink another family's savings. Taking action in Athens, Courtney Crown, WHNT News 19.